mean, I'm a scientist. I don't know any evidence against evolution. In the sultry summer of 1925, a battle royale raged in Dayton, Tennessee, as political titans Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan clashed in the trial of high school teacher John Scopes, who was accused of teaching the evolution of humans from lower animals. The Scopes trial cast a long shadow. Even today, it continues to be used to dismiss anyone skeptical of evolution as unintelligent or unsophisticated. Few people would ever accuse famous Oxford scholar C.S. Lewis of being either. Yet during the summer of the Scopes trial in America, a 20-something C.S. Lewis in England was expressing his own doubts about Darwin. A veteran of the front lines of World War I, Lewis had just been elected a fellow of Magdalen College at Oxford. Previously a tutor in philosophy, his new position was in English literature. A few weeks after the Scopes trial, C.S. Lewis wrote his father about his change in academic fields. He commented that although he was glad of the change, he was grateful for something he had learned from philosophy. It will be a comfort to me all my life, he wrote, to know that the scientist and the materialist have not the last word, that Darwin and Spencer, undermining ancestral beliefs, stand themselves on a foundation of sand, of gigantic assumptions and irreconcilable contradictions. Lewis was an atheist at this point in his life, but he already had gnawing doubts about Darwin's theory. Lewis retained a keen interest in evolution for the rest of his life. He discussed the topic repeatedly in his books and essays. He wrote about it in his private letters, and his personal library contained more than a dozen books and pamphlets focused on evolution, some of which were marked up with extensive underlining and annotations, including his personal copy of Charles Darwin's autobiography. Yet, for many people, Lewis's view of evolution remains a mystery. Some argue he ultimately embraced Darwinian evolution. Others claim he dismissed evolution as a myth. What were his real views, and are they relevant for us today? To understand Lewis's view of evolution, I think we first need to ask, what is evolution? Really, there are two big claims of modern evolutionary theory as a scientific theory. The first is common ancestry. Everything goes back to one universal common ancestor. So human beings, we don't just share an ancestor, say, with chimps. We share an ancestor with fungi. You know, everything goes back to one uh, common ancestor. The second claim is that the primary engine of how evolution took place was a blind, undirected process of natural selection acting on random variations in nature. So really it's an unguided, blind, purposeless process. And that really was Darwin's view. And that really is the modern view accepted by uh, most biologists. So what was Lewis's view on this? Well, on common ancestry, Lewis uh, had no objection in principle to common ancestry, although in practice, he was somewhat skeptical, uh, especially of some of the claims about human evolution. Again, he had no principled objection to it, he had no theological objection to it, but he did think some of the science might be overblown, and so he never really unreservedly uh, embraced it. And near the end of his life, when there was the big scandal about the Piltdown Man, that was supposed to be one of the big missing links between humans and pre-human ancestors, that was exploded as really a hoax and a fake during Lewis's life. Lewis was rather amused and bemused by that. And it's interesting that a couple of years before the Piltdown hoax was actually formally exposed, but there had already been some questions raising about it, 
Lewis already wrote a poem poking fun at the fake from Piltdown, even before the hoax had been generally uh, exposed, just when people were raising some critical questions about it. Apart from common ancestry, Lewis knew that the truly momentous claim of modern evolutionary theory is its insistence that life is the product of a blind and unguided process. Darwin himself repeatedly made clear that evolution by natural selection acted without the benefit of design or foresight. In his words, the old argument of design in nature, which formerly seemed to me so conclusive, fails now that the law of natural selection has been discovered. This remains the dominant view of evolution in the scientific community today. In the words of 38 Nobel laureates, evolution is the result of an unguided, unplanned process of random variation and natural selection. C.S. Lewis was deeply skeptical that unguided natural selection could create fundamentally new things. He did think natural selection was a real process, but when he wrote about it, he said, well, it can do things like, uh, you know, you can have a wing and it can knock out something. It can make, basically make you less complicated. It can knock out an existing function. So really what he was talking about there, what today would be called microevolutionary processes. Lewis doesn't talk a lot about natural selection being able to create, you know, uh, much more complicated, intricate things or higher level organisms. Lewis's view of the limits of natural selection was shaped by the work of Henri Bergson, a French natural philosopher and Nobel laureate who was sharply critical of natural selection in his book Creative Evolution. Lewis first read Bergson during World War I while recovering from shrapnel wounds. Bergson believed in evolution, but he didn't think that Darwin's mechanism of natural selection was sufficient to account for it. The Darwinian idea of adaptation by automatic elimination of the unadapted is a simple and clear idea. But because it attributes to the cause which controls evolution a merely negative influence, it has great difficulty in accounting for the progressive development of complex apparatus such as we are about to examine. How can accidental causes occurring in an accidental order be supposed to have repeatedly come to the same result, the causes being infinitely numerous and the effect infinitely complicated? The impact of Bergson on C.S. Lewis was profound. Lewis filled his copy of Bergson's book with annotations and underlining on most of its nearly 400 pages including passages where Bergson critiqued natural selection. Years later, during a lecture in the 1940s, Lewis reaffirmed the view that Bergson's critique of orthodox Darwinism is not easy to answer. But Lewis's doubts about Darwin's mechanism went beyond those raised by Bergson. According to Lewis, the ultimate challenge to unguided natural selection was man himself. How could such a blind material process produce humanity's unique capabilities of reason and conscience? Darwin wrote an entire book, The Descent of Man, to show how his theory of evolution could account for man's mind and morals. Lewis was not persuaded, and his doubts were reinforced by a book from one of his favorite authors, G.K. Chesterton. The book was Chesterton's The Everlasting Man, which Lewis read for the first time in the 1920s. Chesterton argued that man is not merely an evolution, but rather a revolution, one that was beyond the power of a strictly Darwinian process. Another book that influences Lewis's doubts about Darwin was Theism and Humanism by former British Prime Minister Sir Arthur Balfour. Best remembered as the author of the Balfour Declaration that favored a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine, Balfour was also an articulate critic of scientific materialism. Balfour's book argued that if we would maintain the value of our highest beliefs and emotions, beauty must be more than accident. The source of morality must be moral. The source of knowledge must be rational. Lewis drew heavily from Balfour's argument in his own book, Miracles, 
Like Balfour, Lewis claimed that assigning the development of human reason to a non-rational process, like natural selection, ends up undermining our confidence in reason itself. After all, if reason is merely an unintended byproduct of a fundamentally non-rational process, what grounds do we have for regarding its conclusions as objectively true? Lewis knew that the corrosive impact of a Darwinian account of the mind was not merely theoretical. In his personal copy of Darwin's autobiography, he highlighted passages where Darwin himself questioned whether the conclusions of a mind produced by a Darwinian process could in fact be trusted. But then with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of a man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? Just as Lewis rejected a Darwinian explanation for the human mind because it undermined the validity of reason, he rejected a Darwinian account of morality because it undercut the authority of morality by attributing it to an amoral process of survival of the fittest. As Lewis pointed out, the same Darwinian process that produces morality also produces immorality. Because all beliefs and behaviors arise in the same way, there is no objective reason to prefer one over the other. According to Lewis, the person who offers such an account of morality should honestly admit that there is no such thing as right or wrong. Despite his skepticism of key parts of Darwinian theory, Lewis disagreed with fellow Christians, who seemed ready to dismiss all of evolution as necessarily atheistic. At the same time, he also was skeptical of some Christians who thought there were no tensions between orthodox Darwinian theory and belief in God. In fact, Lewis was highly critical of theists and others who tried to find a halfway house between blind Darwinian evolution and theism or something else. And this was where he actually was critical of Henri Bergson. Henri Bergson, he accepted Bergson's critique of natural selection. But Bergson then said, well, you know, Darwinian evolution won't work as this blind and guided process. But Bergson didn't want to embrace a guided process by an intelligence. And so he ended up saying, well, uh, there's an emergent form of evolution that sort of does grope towards complexity and it is sort of purposeful, but there really is no purposeful agent. And Lewis thought this was nonsense. There really, you really don't have uh, much of a choice. Either evolution, if it happened, was a mindless process or it was directed by a mind. If it was directed by a mind, then basically it was directed by intelligent design. And as long as you thought that evolution was driven by a mind, then Lewis would be fine with that. He wasn't fine with people who tried to split the difference. And today, a lot of people who call themselves theistic evolutionists really want to split the difference. They claim that they don't want to believe that it was just chance and necessity, but they actually talk about evolution having these natural capacities that somehow acts purposefully even though it's not being directed. And this is a point that Lewis made in uh, his book Mere Christianity where he had a little addendum to one of the chapters where he attacks Bergson and others who promote this idea of emergent evolution that somehow even without a mind it's not blind like Darwin thought it was so it's somewhat purposeful without someone who has a purpose. And Lewis said you know, again this just logically doesn't make sense. Lewis near the end of his life uh, read a book by Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, The Phenomenon of Man, one of the leading theistic evolutionists uh, of Lewis's day. Uh, this was actually a book published after de Chardin's death. It's somewhat humorous to read Lewis's annotations of his own copy of de Chardin's book because it has all these snarky comments raising questions for de Chardin. And in fact, we know from Lewis's letters to people that Lewis really was not persuaded at all by de Chardin. And again, in Lewis's lifetime, this was one of the preeminent spokespeople for this sort of emergent type of theistic, non-theistic evolution that tries to square the difference and say that you can have evolution that isn't just quite blind in a Darwinian sense, but also isn't directed by design.
As he grew older, Lewis became even more critical of evolutionary theory. Some of Lewis's mounting skepticism was likely due to his correspondence with Captain Bernard Ackworth, a leader in Britain's evolution protest movement. Starting in the mid-1940s, Ackworth began sending Lewis books and essays critical of Darwin's theory, materials which Lewis read and retained for his private library. In 1951, Ackworth sent Lewis a lengthy manuscript critical of evolution. Lewis wrote back that he had read nearly all of Ackworth's manuscript and it had shaken him. The most telling point for Lewis was the dogmatism of the evolutionary scientists cited by Ackworth. Lewis told Ackworth that it was the fanatical and twisted attitudes of evolution's defenders that now inclined him to agree that evolution was the central and radical lie in the whole web of falsehood that now governs our lives. Lewis was troubled by the growing intolerance he saw among evolutionists, who seemed to treat any criticism of their views as an attack upon science itself. Lewis had a sharply different vision of what science should be like. In his view, there was nothing anti-science about questioning dogmatic claims made in the name of science. Indeed, he thought good science recognized the benefits of questions and criticisms in helping science correct its own errors. Lewis's growing awareness of the fallibility of science was expressed powerfully in his final book, The Discarded Image. Published after his death, the book on its surface is an exploration of the medieval worldview, but one of its underlying themes is the nature of modern science. Lewis argues in the book that scientific theories are supposals rather than facts. These supposals try to account for as many facts as possible, with as few assumptions as possible. But according to Lewis, we must always recognize that such supposals by scientists are provisional. They can be wrong. Lewis further argued that scientific revolutions often are not the result simply of discovering new facts. Lewis was very perceptive when it came to scientific revolutions. He pointed out that science often changes not just because of the evidence, but because people see what they want to see. One of the scientific revolutions he pointed out was this way, was actually the Darwinian revolution in biology. He said, you can look for the decades and centuries before Darwin proclaimed his theory for people uh, really yearning for a developing universe with progress, with inevitable progress, you know, going from ruder and cruder things to more developed things. And he said that idea predated Darwin. And then when Darwin came up with his ideas, his ideas were accepted largely, in Lewis's view, because this earlier presupposition, this earlier idea that we wanted to see progress in nature uh, was there to begin with. And so we saw what we wanted to see. This was a pretty radical view of science. It really countered the view that I think we all get in school, which is science, at least modern science, goes from triumph to triumph. You know, it's from the age of superstition back in the Middle Ages to now, you know, science is just the focus on the facts, look at the evidence, that's all there is, and stuff that has enough evidence, that's what changes in science. And one of the dangers of being in a existing scientific paradigm, or what Lewis would call a scientific model of an era, is that it limits you to asking only certain questions and blinds you to asking other questions. And he was concerned about that and thought that people should be concerned about you know, what questions weren't being asked. And I think that's very relevant to us today. For example, with Darwinian theory, you can think of all sorts of things that we've been blinded to asking uh, because we're enmeshed in sort of that paradigm. Uh, for example, for many years, scientists thought that the vast majority of our DNA was junk. They thought this because they thought we were the product of a blind Darwinian process, and so it would be rational to expect that much of our DNA is just junk. On the other hand, if you actually believe that things were developed through intelligent design, you might not rush to that conclusion. You might actually think that, well, if you have lots of DNA that doesn't seem to have a purpose, uh, because it doesn't code for proteins, that there may yet be a purpose there uh, if things were intelligently designed. And in fact, what we've seen in the past just three to five years is an avalanche of evidence, basically, that the so-called junk DNA, the non-protein coding DNA, 
is fulfilling very useful functions. In fact, sometimes critical functions that we couldn't even exist if it wasn't happening. And so far from being useless or junk DNA, it's really critical. Well, this was a, really a great example of what Lewis was talking about in that your current paradigm limits the sort of questions you're asking. Now that we've actually found out this evidence, you know, there, scientists are having to own up to it, but Darwinism really did help uh, limit or help uh, restrict people even from asking that question to begin with. Another thing is the Darwinian obsession over the past century for vestigial organs. You know, whether it be the appendix or tonsils, if you doesn't seem to work in a certain way, uh, the Darwinian explanation is write it off. That's something, a leftover product from the evolutionary process. Yet in many of these things, including the tonsils and the appendix, we now know have vital biological functions. So again, Darwinism actually as a paradigm helps restrict what questions you even ask of nature. And so I think one of the things that we can learn from Lewis is the importance of asking questions outside the box in science.